Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, a special welcome to anyone who is new among us. Uh, after the worship service, I invite you to go back to the uh, where I'll be standing. There will be someone to have a little goodie bag of information uh, for you about the life of this church. I invite everybody, new and old alike, to take out the red friendship pads, put out your name, send it down the aisle, and send it on back and notice who's who in your pew. Um, a couple of announcements on the green sheet that I want to highlight today. First, next Sunday we are taking the one great hour of sharing offering that goes to disaster assistance. That it's the primary support for disaster assistance for self-development of people and some other great causes all around the world. We'll be taking that offering next Sunday. This weekend uh, is going to be the youth garage sale. And I know you've been waiting all year to bring your stuff for the youth garage sale. And now you finally can. Thank you to everybody who held off until tomorrow to bring your stuff. That's not everyone I know, but that's what they asked for. So bring your stuff in and come buy some stuff at a garage sale. Uh, it'll raise money for Haiti. And also today is the last Sunday to sign up for pictures for the photo directory right out here in the narthex. The, I know most of you have signed up. Thank you so much for doing that. But I think we still have a few holdouts. Let me tell you, it really is super helpful to me personally, but also to all of us as a community to know one another's names and faces because I have discovered that not everyone knows everybody else's face here. And as good looking as your face is, you want that in the directory. All right, we also have a flower up here, um, and the flower is for Wayne Singer, who is a soon-to-be new member. How do you like that? Uh, Wayne Singer's new grandson, Levi Singer. Now, right now, let's lift our hearts to God in worship. Right now, we have a special moment in the life of the church. I'm going to invite Ann and John Wheeler Waddell, there you are, to come forward. We have among us missionaries. I hope we have among us many, many missionaries in the place that God has put us here in Medford, Oregon. But we also have among us Ann and John who have been, oh, come on up here. People need to see you. People need to see just how tall you are there, John. Uh, <laughs> um, but who are sent to Ethiopia. Could you just share a little bit about the mission that you are going to be doing over there? Uh, we have a microphone right there. Or you can uh, yell. Yeah, <laughs> we can do that too. <laughs> Um, we're returning to teach for two months at the Ethiopian Graduate School of Theology. We were there full time from 2004 to 2008, but now we go back once a year for shorter periods. And we'll be teaching three classes. And if, can we share sure. a, just a couple of prayer requests? <laughs> One, um, we're traveling tomorrow and Tuesday, and we would pray for good connections and a safe arrival in Addis Ababa Tuesday night. And we're teaching three classes. One we've taught before, two are new to us, and someone else has been teaching them the first half of the semester. We're picking them up halfway through, and we're not quite sure what we're picking up. <laughs> so we have a few days this week to find that out before we start teaching on Tuesday. And then just pray for our spirits and our, our, just our relationship with God, Ethiopia can be a difficult place to live and sometimes it wears on us and uh, pray we uh, stay healthy <laughs> in all ways in all ways yes let's have a prayer for these guys and let us keep them in prayer for the two months that they will be there um, I will say when I was speaking to Rob Weingartner the head of the Presbyterian Outreach Foundation and I just asked him Rob what's the number one thing that people ask for What's the number one thing that the people in the two-thirds world want from Christians in the West? And he says, actually training for their pastors, training for their leaders. Um, they, they really want people who can share the good news of Jesus Christ and have good biblical foundations for them. So let's have this prayer with you guys right now as you're doing that. Lord, I just thank you for John, for Anne, for the calling you have put onto their lives. I do pray for their health. Pray for their travel. Pray for their mission of teaching. Pray for their relationship during this time. I pray for the ministries that, of, of, of interruption 
that you will put in their lives along the way. Lord, bless them every single step, every moment of every day. Help them to know that they are part of your mission and what steps to take to advance your mission. Lord, that is the same prayer for us. May we be inspired by their example to be missionaries where you've placed us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Well, friends, today as we come to Scripture, we're coming to the very last sermon in this sermon series. The sermon series has been, Why Church? Why Does the Church Exist? And today we're coming to talk about the church exists to be the community of God. And so as we're doing that, we're, we're coming to, the, the text for us today is Acts chapter 2. It's the text of Pentecost, right? The miracle of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came upon all of the believers. There were 120 of them, and they, and they amazingly could speak in different languages, languages they had never learned, and they were praising God in different languages, and people who spoke all of those different languages were in Jerusalem at that time, and they came and they heard them praising God in different languages, and Peter proclaimed Jesus Christ to them, and 3,000 people came to saving faith in Jesus Christ that day. It's a great story. But let's not forget the very next verses. That's the ones we're going to read today. Of what do those 3,000 people do? Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we're talking about church as community. You know, there are some things it is hard to do by yourself. Have you noticed? There are some things it's hard to do by yourself. My Uncle Jimmy, actually he's my grandmother's first cousin, was always telling stories about he got himself into such trouble. And you know, the man was a retired car salesman. I never knew if these stories were true or not. <laughs> but one of my favorite stories was a story when he said that he, that he and his wife, Anne, went on vacation. And, you know, they went across several different time zones and were in this new place. And they arrived and the airline had lost their luggage. And he was tired and he was all this, ah, oh, what am I going to do? They said, okay, just go to your hotel room, go to your motel room. And they were kind of motel level travelers. You go to your motel room and uh, we will deliver the luggage to you. It'll just come on the next flight. Okay, okay. So Ann and Jimmy, they went to the, uh, to the motel and they took a nap because they were tired. And, and Jimmy here, he didn't have his pajamas with him and he didn't want to get his clothes wrinkled, so he just took a nap in his underwear. That becomes important later in the story. Because you see, he, he had a, there was a knock on the door and, you know, groggy, he gets up and he looks out the door and there are his four suitcases, four suitcases, two each. Back then you could check luggage. And um, you know, there were these four suitcases. And so he probably wouldn't have done this if he'd been just a little more awake. But he looked around and no one seemed to be looking. So he stepped out into the walkway and it is hard to pick up four suitcases all by yourself. As he was trying to pick up four suitcases all by yourself, he, he heard a click behind him. And the door had closed. And here he is standing outside at the little walkway at the motel. He turns around and taps gently on the door to wake up Anne. Nothing. Tapped a little less gently. Nothing. He starts knocking. He starts pounding. He starts calling. Anne, Anne, open the door. Well, Anne had taken out her hearing aids. She was dead to the world. <laughs> and by this point, there were other people who started noticing there's this guy in his underwear banging on the door. Please let me in. I don't know what kind of domestic dispute they thought was going on there. But, but here, Jimmy, and, and he realizes he's got to go down to the front desk to get a key, right? And he knows that these guys are watching him, and he knows the suitcases are right here, and he was concerned that they might steal these suitcases. So he picks up 
all four suitcases, <laughs> manages them somehow down the walkway, down the stairs, into the lobby where he asks a very surprised desk clerk for a key. All four suitcases back up the stairs, back down the walkway, back in, opened the door and woke Anne up to tell her the whole story. And Anne looked at him and said, Jimmy, why didn't you open a suitcase and put on some clothes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, there are some things it is hard to do by yourself, like thinking. <laughs> or carrying four suitcases. Yes, yes, yes. That's why we have one another, right? That's why we have church, because there are some things it's hard to do by yourselves. We need one another. We need community. We are created for community. If you go all the way back to the first chapter of the Bible... God is creating all of these wonderful things. You, you probably know, you know, he creates something. He says, oh, it's good, right? Creates light. It's good. Creates sky. It's good. Creates plants. It's good. Creates animals. It's good. But there's one thing in creation God said was not good. Genesis 2.18 said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So God created us male and female. God created us when we were perfect in the very beginning to need community, to need one another, and to need someone who's a little bit different from us. Men and women, a little different. You may have noticed. I somehow suspect that God was chuckling a little bit when he did that. But he knew, know that he created us to need someone who's a little bit different for the human race to continue. We need community. We are created for it. And that's back when we were perfect. Now, as soon as people sinned, God had a mission to restore creation, and God's mission to restore us involved community as well. God called not just Abraham, but Abraham's family, right? The people of Israel were called to be a community of people to reflect God to the world. And he had them in smaller communities of families and tribes and clans, families, clans, and tribes. And then when Jesus came, Jesus created community, right? He called together a community of disciples. And he told his disciples to make other disciples to expand the community. And here in chapter 2 of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit came and called people together into community. A lot of people focus on Pentecost, and they focus on the, the speaking in tongues part of it. That was an amazing miracle, but the primary effect of the Holy Spirit was not this spiritual experience. The primary effect was that people came together in faith in Jesus Christ and came together in community. You see, the mission of God requires community. Always has. In fact, just this series... We've been talking about our great commission. Our great commission that Jesus gives us as his community, as his disciples, is to make disciples. We've said disciples are people who live as a sacrifice, which means, which is worship. People who apprentice ourselves to Jesus Christ, live as Jesus lived. That's discipleship. And people who reach out to others with his love and with his good news. That's mission. That is our commission, and the truth is, every single one of those, worship, discipleship, and mission, all of them require community. We cannot truly worship without community. We can pray, we can sing, we can study the Bible, but remember, worship means giving our lives as a sacrifice to God, and I don't know anyone who has come to faith to truly give their lives as a sacrifice to God without other Christians walking them along the journey. I don't know anybody who just woke up one morning and said, you know, I've never known a Christ follower, but I think I'd like to be one. No, Paul says in Romans 10, 14, you know, he's quoting a part of the Old Testament that says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. He says, but how can people call on someone they don't believe in? And how can they believe in somebody they haven't heard of? And how are they going to hear of this Jesus if we don't proclaim Jesus to them? That's pretty good logic to me. Now, I do know, I have some friends, Jay and Ann, who are missionaries in the Muslim world. And they tell stories of Muslim followers of Jesus. They're followers of Jesus now, but they were raised Muslim. And they walk into a church saying, I had a dream where this guy Jesus appeared to me and I'm supposed to follow him now, I guess. 
they know literally dozens of people who have come to faith in Jesus Christ through dreams. The Holy Spirit just sent a dream and appeared to them. It's kind of like the story of Paul, right? On the road to Damascus, Jesus just appeared to him. But that's rare, guys. And even when those people just sort of did wake up to follow Jesus, the first thing they did is join the community of faith. Because we need community to worship. We need community to live as a sacrifice. Worship requires community. Discipleship requires community. We need community to grow in the faith. We need to support and encourage one another. In fact, that phrase, one another, shows up all over the New Testament. I counted this week, there are 36 different commandments that end with the phrase, one another. Things you cannot do alone, because if you have this one another commandment, you need another. Love one another. Support one another, encourage one another, confess your sins to one another, forgive one another, submit to one another. 36 different commandments that we're supposed to do to one another that we cannot do all by ourselves. We're created to need community because the biggest thing we're called to do as Christians is to love. At that last supper, he told his disciples, by this other people will know you are my followers if you love one another. Now, it's easy for me to think of myself as a pretty loving guy when I'm on my own. When I'm looking in the mirror, man, I am a pretty loving character. It's when you put me in a room with actual other people that it's a little harder to love. Love takes practice. Love takes work. We need, if we're going to love one another, we need other people to practice on, right? That's why God gave us families and churches. Jesus even tells us to love our enemies. And if we need to love our enemies, we need to learn how to do that. We need other enemies to practice on. That's why God gave us families and churches. Right? I don't know about your family, but let me tell you. Truly, we need community to grow more like Jesus Christ to support one another in the process. Some people think they can be good Christians apart from church. Find that anywhere in the scripture. It's not there. Some people think the church is a place, it's sort of a spiritual filling station. It's a place where I come each week and I get filled up so I can live as I want to live or I can praise God or I can, I can, I can. I can? Find that one in scripture. We're not, the church isn't supposed to be a filling station where you just go and, and get filled up and if you don't feel filled at this place, you just go to another place without any sense of commitment or community? No. No, if you read through Scripture, turn to any page in the New Testament, open to any page spread, and you will find some verse or some passage about how to live together in community. We need one another. Discipleship requires community. And mission requires community as well, right? The mission of Christ was to call together this community of disciples, and his commission to them was to continue growing the community of disciples. Jesus' mission was not just to bring individual souls individually to heaven. That's how a lot of people preach it, but that's not how Jesus preached. You read through the New Testament, Jesus preached about the kingdom of God, the part of this world, what, what it is like when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And we don't do that one at a time. We do that together. We exhibit the kingdom of God by being a community who love one another as he has created us to love one another. The mission of God requires community. Some years ago, boy, nearly 15 years ago, in the mid-90s, I uh, was a volunteer with the Billy Graham mission in San Antonio. Um, love the Billy Graham mission. Great organization, does a lot of good things. Uh, when I was going to volunteer, my mindset was, okay, Billy preaches and people come to faith. That was, that was how I understood the model to be. We went to get trained by this trainer who was training all these volunteers, and he says that is not the model of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. The model is Billy preaches, the Holy Spirit moves, and the church responds. That's what he says. 
they trained literally over 1,000 volunteers because we had this great huge event, a week of events in a big stadium, right? We invited people down into the end zone, the football end zone. It's where people would come to pray and, and people who wanted to give their lives to Christ. And we were trained to be counselors. We would counsel with the person, make sure they understood what a commitment to Christ meant. We would pray with them and as they'd pray to give their lives to Christ. And then we were to invite them to church. We were to invite them to my church. Please come to church with me. Or if they had a particular church they wanted to go to, we were supposed to follow up and make sure they made it to that church. Because what our trainer said was, if we get people to the end zone but not to church, it's not a touchdown. Because Billy Graham's Evangelistic Association knew, because Billy Graham knew, that he was helping people through the first step of faith, but they got a long journey ahead of them. And for that journey, for them to continue in worship and discipleship and mission, they needed community. They needed the church. Which means, friends, that the mission of God requires organized religion. I know. That's a dirty word, isn't it? I know that Satan has taken that particular phrase and turned it into a dirty word in our society, organized religion. I know a whole bunch of people who will tell you, I believe in God, I just don't believe in organized religion. I've always wanted to ask those people, do, do you believe in organized education? I mean, I know a lot of people who homeschool, but I don't know anyone who doesn't think schools should exist. Do you believe in organized health care? No, man, people should just get better on their own. Do you believe in organized companies? No, no, people should just go find their own stuff that they need. Do you believe in, you know, last, two weeks ago I talked about discipleship as addiction recovery, right? Recovery from our addiction to sin. Does anybody not believe in organized addiction recovery? People should just quit drinking on their own. How is that going to work? Is there any positive human endeavor that people argue shouldn't be organized? If you put two seconds of thought into the phrase, I don't believe in organized religion, it just doesn't make any sense. If you talk to these people just a little more, ask what's behind that, what you find out, it's not the organization they're against, it's the disorganization. Because you see, different people read Scripture differently. Different people understand God differently and follow God differently and I might have some suggestions for they, how they ought to follow God, and they might have some suggestions for how I ought to follow God. And there are a lot of people who are pretty good at giving suggestions to other people, but not so good at taking suggestions from other people. That's a little too disorganized for them. If I'm supposed to be in community with people and love people and follow God with people who understand and follow God a little differently, that feels a little too disorganized, and it can be a little discomfortable. Now, if you're just praying all by yourself, you can avoid that discomfort entirely. But if you're in community, if you're praying together and studying God's Word together, you risk an encounter with the gospel that is different from how you've encountered the gospel before, and it might even transform you. You see, if you're just having your own private belief system, and your own private practices, and your own private religion with your own private God, you don't need community. But if you want to worship the God of the universe, whom none of us understand perfectly, if you want to worship this God in community with others and have a transformative encounter with the gospel, you might need other people because you're not perfect. I, I'm sorry, but you're not. I mean, think of it, it's, it's like when we sing. You know, when we sing together, it sounds a whole lot better than when each of us sing separately in the shower. I haven't been listening, but I guarantee it. Because right up here, every week that, that I'm in this service, we have this hymn where the choir disappears, all right? And at the beginning of the hymn, it was Take My Life Today, right? At the beginning of the hymn, I'm sitting right over here, and here's the choir. And I'm sounding pretty good when the choir's right next to me, Okay? Because I got Michael Wing right there and John Rogers and, and let's see, Jim Carper. And we got the whole team right here, right? And if I'm singing just a little sharp, I can hear them and kind of correct myself. Or if I'm a little flat, I can hear them and correct myself. And, and even if I'm a little sharp or a little flat, we're all singing together. We kind of blend. And then they disappear. 
And I'm glad the microphone's not on. Because it's a little harder to keep in tune all by yourself. That's why we have a, a choir up here, because different people keep each other in tune, keep each other in line. And we can have different parts who sound a little bit different, but harmonize together. That's why we have a choir. That's why we have a congregational singing in just, instead of just a series of solos. We sing better when we sing together. Now there are some people who really wish everybody else sang just like me. Not like me, but like, like them. Nobody wishes they sang just like me. There's some people who really just want to be with a group of people who sing just like me. And when that happens, you get a whole group of people singing sharp. In the next month, in April, after Easter, we're going to be having some conversations about denominational affairs. We're going to have conversations about how this church relates to our current denomination, the Presbyterian Church USA. And let me tell you, there is some disharmony in the Presbyterian Church USA. Sometimes there is cacophony in the Presbyterian Church USA. And there are some people who say, we're just singing a little off-key, and some people who say, I think we're singing different parts, and some people who say, I think we're singing different tunes. And we're going to have to talk about that. We're going to have to talk about discern, prayerfully discern which one of those is, is true, and, and what do we do about that? I'm not going to talk about all that just right now, but, but I want to highlight this. Throughout the years, we Presbyterians and all of us Protestants, really, have had this history of splitting into these different denominations and splitting and splitting and splitting. And sometimes we split into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller groups to get a group of people who sings just like me. And the thing is, we're all singing off key. What you see, and that's probably true for the Presbyterian Church, by the way. We probably need others who are non-Presbyterians to correct us a little bit. Maybe those who are not Americans to correct us a little bit. Maybe we need to open our ears a little to people all around the world, even Ethiopia, to hear how they follow God, how they understand Scripture. It's so easy to just get focused on us and our own little disharmony. We need to hear the symphony that is going on all around the world so that we can be a part of it. I look at Pentecost. That miracle at Pentecost was not that suddenly everybody could speak and understand the same language. God could have done it that way, but He didn't. The miracle of Pentecost was that God took these people, most of whom were from Galilee, and made them speak a whole bunch of different languages. So that people who were in Jerusalem who could speak a whole bunch of different languages heard them praising God in their own mother tongue. And then the Holy Spirit gathered this community together of extremely diverse people around Jesus Christ. Isn't that an amazing miracle? People from Medes, Parthaginians, I'm not going to quote, they have all of these 20 different places that people are from all around the known world came together around the center of Jesus Christ. That was the miracle that the Holy Spirit wrought on Pentecost. He could pull together a community with extreme diversity and one center, Jesus Christ. If we're going to live into that miracle, if we're going to live into the community we are called to be, we need extreme diversity and we need the center of Jesus Christ. We need to be sure we're staying on that center. How do you form community with people who speak different first languages? You ever think about how bizarrely strange and hard that must have been? You know, before Pentecost, there were 120 people. And that next day, there were 3,000 people. I bet leading up to Pentecost, every single day, Peter was praying, Lord, send the Holy Spirit. Lord, do a great work among us. Help us to be your witnesses with power as you have promised. And then the day, night of Pentecost... I bet Peter was praying, Lord, what am I supposed to do with 3,000 converts? They don't all speak the same language. How do I do that? So, so let's look in Scripture. What did they do? And when you look at what did they do, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They didn't build a building. They didn't start a single committee. They did not even start a worship service. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking bread together, 
and to prayer. Now, devoted themselves. The word devoted has good Old Testament usage. It means, it means a sacrifice. Most sacrifices, someone would sacrifice a lamb and, 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 and offer it to God, but then the family would eat the lamb or someone would eat the lamb. But a devoted sacrifice was one that was completely given to God. So they completely gave themselves over. We talk about living as a sacrifice, as worship. They, they completely gave themselves over to God. And what they gave themselves over to was the apostles' teaching, right? Understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And second, to fellowship, to loving one another, to breaking bread, which I think does mean sharing meals. I think it also means the Lord's Supper. And to prayer. To being connected with the Almighty God. And as they did this, Scripture tells us it had an effect. First, there were miracles being done through the apostles. That's pretty cool. But the effect was, gets noticed in the community. Because the next thing it says is they started sharing stuff. Right? Their community gets deeper and the first step they did is they start sharing stuff. Some people had need, financial needs, and other people were selling stuff and, and helping out. And so nobody had any financial need among their group. That's pretty remarkable. That sounds kind of crazy and cultish in our materialistic society, doesn't it? But they were sharing because they realized that these 3,000 strangers were now family. And it's not, so that stuff's not my stuff, it's family stuff. And the second thing they did, it went every, even deeper it says that they broke bread in their homes. Literally, it says from house to house. They didn't have one place to meet, but they broke bread. They ate together. They shared a very private moment in their real private spaces. They really got involved in each other's lives, got to know one another. And it went deeper because their community had an effect. The effect was God was adding to their number daily those who are being saved. Here's what's amazing to me. It does not say God was adding to their number because of the great preaching they had. It does not say God was adding to their number because of the amazing programs that they had. It describes the community life they had and then said God was adding to their number daily. I suspect other people were looking into this community and saying those people are nuts and I want in. Those people are crazy. Selling stuff and giving it to these strangers they just met. Meeting home to home to home, sharing their personal lives, sharing their personal spaces. That is absolutely nuts. I want in. I want to be a part of a community that loves each other like that. What would it be like to be in a community that loved each other like that? What would it be like to be a part of a community that just shared stuff? You know, I have in my garage a set of mediocre golf clubs. They get used like three times a year. I bet there are a bunch of mediocre golf clubs in the garages in this congregation. If we actually shared stuff, some of us could go together and get some pretty nice golf clubs. And they might get a little more use. And I bet that's true with skis and whatever. You know, I bet there are a bunch of stuff that we all have in our garages that don't get a whole lot of use. And I bet if we started sharing stuff, man, we could get some top-notch stuff. What would it be like to be in a community that shared stuff where nobody had any need? What would it be like to be in a community that cared? Where when somebody was in the hospital, it's not just Lori who showed up, but it's actually a whole bunch of different people showed up to care. Maybe you didn't even have to be in the hospital for people to come and, and care. We can't really do this with 500 people, but, but what if you had a group of people who prayed for you, maybe six, ten people who prayed for you every day, and you prayed for them every day, and you really cared about what was going on in one another's lives every day? What would it be like to be in a community that cared? What would it be like to be in a community that were involved in our private spaces. A community that truly encouraged one another to grow in Jesus Christ. A community where we could, as James says, confess sins to one another and graciously offer God's forgiveness to one another. Maybe even confront one another, challenge one another, encourage one another, support one another. Where we could live out those one another verbs in a way that grew all of us more like Jesus Christ every day. 
There's a part of me that thinks that sounds kind of scary. There's a part of me that really likes to be kind of private. There's a part of me that hopes you have this image of me that I try to give you this image of me and you have that image in your head and you think that's who I am. For my sake, I, I even wear a robe, you know. I could gain 20 pounds, you'd never know it. But there is a deeper part of me that wants to be known. There's a deeper part of me that wants to be known and loved. That wants you to know what my faults are and say, I love you anyway. And I know God loves us. I know God knows everything about us and loves us anyway, but I think we need other people. I think we are created to need other people who can look at us and say, I know you and I love you. And when we do that, we can be reflections of God to one another. Isn't that the kingdom of God? What would it be like to be in a community like that? What would it be like to be in a community that had an effect? See, if I think we were in a community like that, I don't think we could keep people away. People would look at us and say, those people are nuts, and I want in. Look how they love one another. This, this Jesus guy has some impact on their lives. I want to know more. I want to try it out. People might walk in not because they believe in Jesus, but because they see the love we have for one another. What would it be like to be in a community like that? I think we need more of that at Westminster. And when I say that, my mind turns on, how can I preach about that? How can I organize for that? How can I get the session on board and the committees on board? How can we get our facilities geared around that? And then I look at the New Testament and realize they didn't have any of that. They didn't do any of that. They were simply inspired by the Holy Spirit to love one another, and maybe it's just that simple. You know, just this week, I was, I was out at the manor, had lunch with, with a member of our congregation uh, out at the manor, and he was giving me a tour of the whole place. Uh, it's quite a place, let me tell you. Uh, there's a lot to it. But as we were walking down the hallway, we saw somebody else who's a member of, of, of our church who's been having some real health challenges. And we just stopped and talked, how are you doing? been praying for you. And somebody else who's stopped by, his, he's in the, the health center there and uh, not walking too well, just stopped by to say happy birthday to you. And it wasn't programmed. There wasn't a committee for this. It was just a natural outgrowth of, of how this person lives his life and who he is and the character God's grown in him. It was just so natural and so loving. How can we do more of that? I'll talk to the session. I'll talk to the committees. We'll talk about how to plan and program for that. But, but this week, I want to give you a challenge. This week, reach out to somebody. Reach out to somebody who's a part of this community at Westminster. Reach out to somebody who might be a little different from you. Maybe a different age, maybe a different perspective, maybe a different health situation. Just reach out to somebody. Maybe give them a phone call. Have them out for coffee. Have them for dinner or dessert. Or whatever it is. Let's start building community even more than we have. I honestly think we do this fairly well in the time I've gotten to know people at Westminster. I want to do it even better. I want to take it to the next level. I want to take it to crazy cultish level. Where people look at us and say, wow, they love each other. Wow, I think that's the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, help us to love one another because you love us. Help us to love one another to show the world that you love us. Help us to love one another to show the world you love them too. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, go out into this world to be the community God has created us to be. And as you go, know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you now and evermore. Amen.